In a random room, a boy wakes up to the alarm on his phone. As he opens his eyes, he is startled. The entire room is painted with red scriptures. He wonders who could have written all that while he was asleep. However, strangely, the letters begin to disappear. He then thinks he must have been hallucinating because he just woke up. Weird how realistic it seemed. But then he looks to the side and notices. The room he is in is not his room. Getting up, he wonders what kind of place this is. The instant noodles he ate and the two tissues he threw on the floor are no longer there. Obviously, he gets confused and starts to freak out. He seems to receive memories from another life of someone who is identical to him. Moreover, both are orphans, but they followed different paths. Our protagonist studied all his life and got into an amazing university. But the guy whose body he took over dropped out of school and had a horrible job. Looking at his trembling hand, he wonders if he is in some other world. And what was the relation of those words written in blood on the ceiling? In the memories of the original owner of this body, there is nothing about that. He stands there trying to understand the situation. When someone calls him husband and says it's time for breakfast. When he turns around, he sees a woman with large curves. Looking at her thighs, he wonders what this husband thing is about. In his parallel world, did he get married so early? She sits on the bed and tells him to get up, it's getting late. Now the rascal already thinks that the transmigration wasn't so bad. He swallows hard, thinking that if it weren't for this transmigration, he would never have such a beautiful and kind woman. She keeps calling him to have breakfast. He doesn't know whether to call her baby, wife, or darling. He then decides to delve into the memories to find her name, so it would be easier. He starts thinking and strangely finds nothing. His mind seems to split. No name, no experiences, no hobbies, no favorite position, nothing. There is absolutely nothing about her in his memory. He looks back hesitantly, realizing she is standing still, and he already knows this so-called wife is strange, and a fly lands on her eye. Hesitant, he asks who she is. She stands still for a second. She then says that it seems he can see, already opening a monstrous mouth. Sweet and cold, the protagonist says that he is just a little confused, he will think about it properly. But now she has already turned into a giant creature saying that he can see. He cries for a second, but in the next, he is devoured. Suddenly, he wakes up in bed again, sweating cold and wondering what happened. He looks up, certain that everything was a dream, only to see the words and blood once again there. He can't read them, the things disappear, and he thinks there might have been some kind of clue there. Staring at his own hand, he thinks he will have to pretend to be blind. But putting his hand on his head, he knows. In the memories of the owner of this body, he wasn't blind, so it makes no sense. He is a guy who always lived alone and never saw or heard anything out of the ordinary. That means he can't let this woman know that he can see her. For now, he will have to pretend she doesn't exist. A hand comes through the door and calls him, saying he just woke up and it's time for breakfast. Seductively, she approaches while he thinks he will have to ignore and see how the former owner lived. She places the dragon balls in play and asks if he is awake. Sweet and cold, he knows he can't move and can't see or else he will die. But suddenly, she turns her neck and approaches him, while he insists to himself that he can't show any reaction. But she keeps getting closer and suddenly her tongue comes out of her mouth. As it touches his face, he shows a reaction, and then she knows he can see. His face begins to be consumed by a curse, and suddenly he explodes. In the next second, he opens his eyes and gets up startled again. But now he is angry at that damn woman. The poor guy wakes up sweating cold and tries to stop to reason and starts to wonder. Is he being resurrected or is this a time loop? Apparently it's like when you save a point in a game. He grabs his phone knowing she wanted to force him to show a reaction. He puts on TikTok videos of dancing e-girls to pretend he's distracted. When once again she appears behind him and says it's time for breakfast. She calls for her husband and asks why he is looking at other women like that in front of her. He starts talking to himself, saying that he loves that girl from the live stream. Meanwhile, his wife asks if he doesn't like her anymore. She approaches and says she knows he doesn't have a vision problem. So why is the phone so close? Is he seeing her by any chance? He goes back to fiddling with his phone, wondering if he can't even seem strange. However, he calms down a bit since she didn't show a reaction. He then goes back to looking for other live streams. But then he gets a scare. She appears live streaming on his phone. He stands up and throws the phone on the bed, scared. As he trembles a bit, she behind him says he can see. She opens her monstrous mouth to eat him, but now he comes to throw a punch. But she dodges, and then there's nothing he can do. A bite to the arm, he agonizes and dies once again. While she feeds on the pieces, he wonders if that is really his remains. And with that, he starts losing consciousness again. Once more, she says it's time for breakfast, and she approaches, startling him. Up to the sixth time he resurrected, he still got scared just by her getting close to his face and he died multiple times because he couldn't act very well. On the eighth time, he tried to escape from that room, but there was no way and she realized that she could be seen. So he concluded that he should pretend to like her since there was no escape. As soon as she came to get breakfast, he said she was amazing. His plan was to take advantage of that as much as possible. But in the end, he went hungry and she ate everything. And so he died 13 times in a row while trying to find some way to calm down. Some people who go insane become very sane. But for him, death kept coming. It reached 14, 15, 16. And with each death, he received new memories of the owner of that body. He started to understand a bit about that world and how different it was from his world. 
This is a place full of bizarre tales. On the 18th death, he wondered why he was reliving. Who wrote those words in blood and why do they disappear as soon as he looked at them? Once again, he opens his eyes, wondering who is responsible for all this. He doesn't know who it is, but he knows his wife is one of them. She is a monster, and he began to repeat to himself that she should die because he deserved to live. Once again, she came through the door, calling him husband and saying it was time for breakfast. He got up knowing that every time she comes to do this, but never forces physical contact. Standing in the door, she asked if he wanted to start the day by eating some hot, moist meat. He got extremely close, but he walked right through as expected. She can only do something where she is sure he can see. He wanted to prepare some food while she, desperate at his side, said she already made breakfast and was ready for him. The poor guy sighed, thinking that the more beautiful, the better the lie. She's saying it's ready, but clearly there's nothing prepared. He made a snack, knowing that only by leaving that room would he find something about his wife. When he went to bite the snack, she had transformed into the floor, asking if he was seeing anything. He went to the door to open it, knowing he needed to get out of there. And she was visible on the doorknob, asking where he was going and why he wouldn't stay home with her. But he just opened the door and left the room, saying to himself that no one kills him 18 times and gets away with it. Now he wants revenge. As soon as he finds a way to eliminate her, he will come back here. But as soon as he opens the apartment door, he gets a scare looking at the sky. The world is red and filled with deformed creatures. In front of him, only the silhouettes of people. He gets scared by that and starts laughing like a psychopath, saying that this world is really interesting. But he feels something strange and vomits on the sidewalk. Suddenly someone appears, asking if the uncle is okay. He looks startled and it's just a little girl wanting to know if he's sick. He tells her he's fine and she can call him Big Brother. Patting her head, he thinks she's so cute that he would love to have a daughter. But she becomes deformed instantly, saying he can see. His heart stops and he looks up. The girl turned into a giant demon with a blade. Our protagonist is at a loss for words and then starts laughing loudly, saying that this world is very, very interesting. He likes it and tells her that he really likes this appearance, because that way, when he kills her, he won't feel any guilt. He will end all the weirdos in this place without any remorse. But this time, he was torn to pieces. Once again, he wakes up in bed with the balloon wife asking if her husband is okay. The sun is already rising. The poor guy thinks that having breakfast 20 times in one day is really tiring. Some time later, he is sitting on a park bench. Once again, the little girl comes and asks where her mother is, can he take her home? While he's thinking about the madness and all the kinds of strangeness in this place. One type is the completely strange and irrational ones. They are aggressive but can't affect anything like air. The other type is the creatures that are identical to humans. They do nothing but try to get close to you. But as soon as they get a reaction, they make their move. Exactly like that wife. He knows that no normal person in that world can perceive their existence. But even so, they cling to them. Why do they want that? He thinks that maybe these creatures want to integrate into human life. Sometime later, he is holding his phone and received a payment of three cents. To survive in this world, at least he will need a bit of money to discover the things he needs. In the workgroup, a guy named Wu Dai is calling for him. The name of our protagonist is Yizui Fangxiu. He works selling apartments for a company and knows he hasn't received the commission for one he sold recently. So he sends a message saying he is going to settle that. And he speeds up on his bike. When he gets there, strangely, it is a hospital instead of the company's building. The place looks more like an abandoned building. He stands sweating cold at the door, wondering if this is the sales place. He reaches the door and his phone rings. He says he is coming up and asks if everyone is in the office. The people say yes, that the owner's son tried calling him several times, but he didn't answer. The protagonist says that's fine, then he will come up. Our boy realizes that this place is definitely affected by reality. But the people on the call didn't seem to be doing badly. He finds it strange, but also interesting. Walking down the corridor, he suddenly bumps into something. He feels he touched something soft and wonders what it was. He calmly reaches with his hand, wanting to know if that is the limit he can go. But what he touches are two magical spheres of clairvoyance that predict a pleasant future. The rascal blushes, and suddenly, he feels something. A slap lands on his face. The girl appears screaming that she will complain about him, and she runs toward the guard while he doesn't understand what is happening. When he looks up, it says Baylor Academy. But as soon as he blinks, the place turns back into the abandoned hospital. He reaches toward a hospital wall, but strangely his hand goes through. He realizes he can't interact with the physical form of it, and thinks that maybe it's like the creatures that need certain conditions. Once again, he passes his hand through the wall, and with that, he goes through it. He feels a bit dizzy and sees an abandoned corridor. Sometime later, he has already looked in several rooms, but they are all empty. But in one of the doors, there is a strong smell of blood. Has and he once again goes to pass through it. He ends up in a room where there seems to be a girl on the floor crying. He keeps looking and she starts to get up, and she looks at him, calling him Big Brother. But now he is resilient and ignores her, passing through the wall. As soon as he comes out on the other side, he faces another creature. But he keeps walking. Even the monster looks confused and he realizes that there are dozens of strange things there. Every place he enters has a bunch of weird stuff. And the bizarre thing is that some rooms are open in a way that they could escape. Now he's getting good and doesn't show any reaction. 
All thanks to the dear wife who killed him 18 times. Suddenly, he sees some papers on the floor that talk about experiment number 128 that underwent a transformation. He crouches to pick them up, wondering if all the transformed are really human. But unfortunately, he can't even turn the page to know what's written since he doesn't belong to that world. Suddenly, something passes through him. He stands up, and it was the hair of a monster on the ceiling. She descends beside his face and asks why he is there. By any chance, is he looking to explore the mysteries of life with her? He ignores her while thinking that maybe the best place to go is the director's office. The mental hospital building is the same one from the memory of the body's owner, which should have been a sales company. And the director's office is where the old staff room used to be. He decides to go upstairs to see if there's anything there. As he walks down the corridor, someone calls for Brother Xu and asks what he's doing there. Suddenly, a chubby guy appears, yelling at him, asking how he dares to come to work if he's already been fired. But Fang Xu walks down the corridor and pushes the two aside, thinking there's nothing on this floor. The guy with glasses looks confused, and the boss is cursing at him, asking why he's going to the second floor and telling the guy with glasses to stop him. But our protagonist is already walking over there, and finally finds the director's office. Someone yells for him to stop, but he's already got his hand on the doorknob. The friends behind him are freaking out, saying it's all over. But just by seeing the leg, you already know what's coming. Look at the waistline, look at the little mouth. In fact, the colleague was already being squashed. The people ask who the protagonist is and what he's doing there. And he suddenly grabs her arm. She tells him to let go and asks what he's doing. But he just throws her aside, saying she's too noisy. She falls and the guy goes to help her without doing anything. While he finds a paper on the desk, and as he expected, there is some kind of big secret in this mental hospital. The message says that if he wants to receive the gift of fate and uncover the secrets of this world, he has to go to room 520. He wonders if this letter was for him, and leaves wanting to know how they knew he was coming. It's in building C, room 520. Suddenly the lamp bursts. The friend with glasses is still following him, while the other three who stayed behind are saying they are scared. He turns on his phone, saying something is not right. The friend beside him says he's acting strange today. Why isn't he talking to anyone? He uses the phone to light up the second floor, and realizes he's no longer in the mental hospital, but in the old company. The guy having fun asks the chubby one for his phone, who says it also has no signal. He tells him not to worry, because with his status he can access more than he imagines. But if he's not wrong, all these things point to them having entered a strange world. An entire place that was once a normal reality now seems to be suffering anomalies. The people who were working are still worried about not delivering the service. One of the building's guards asks if everything is okay, and says he will take a look to see what happened. One of the girls crouches to pick up her phone and turns on the flashlight, but says it's too weak. The protagonist is there too. He turns on his and asks the guy with glasses why his light is also so low. People are questioning the blonde guy about what he said about them entering a strange world, when suddenly he loses his temper and tells everyone to shut up, saying they need to stay calm because that's the only way they'll survive. People fall silent, seeing that he got stressed out of nowhere, and the guy explains that in simple terms, they have entered a world full of ghosts. Basically, it's an alternate dimension where they live. People are silent for a second and ask about the guard who went to check the light. It's been three minutes and he hasn't returned. Tang once again warns that in this world, you can't violate any ghost rules or you'll die. The chubby guy, trembling, asks what they're going to do now then. He replies that they urgently need to find a way to escape from there or everyone in that place will die. The protagonist is sweating cold and hears a sound behind him. From the familiar sensation, he knows it's a ghost approaching. He warns everyone that one is about to arrive. People tell him to stop joking because there's no ghost there. But one of the girls gets grabbed by the hair, while Fang Zhu watches the people scream, until he says that Shaoli is already gone. The girl with glasses is scared, saying she must have walked away. She was right next to her and starts calling for her friend, telling her to say something. No one there can see anything properly, due to the darkness. Yu Tang asks the protagonist if he saw the ghost's appearance. He replies that unfortunately he couldn't see it since the girl disappeared suddenly. At this moment, everyone starts doubting Fang Zhu Xu, saying that he's acting strange. Yu Tang says that he doesn't seem afraid at all. Could he be a spiritual master? Confused, he asks what that is. The guy finds it strange that Fang Xu doesn't know what a spiritual master is but is too calm. His identity is in question. The guy explains that a spiritual master is someone who can control their spiritual energy. And in moments like these, they are the necessary people. Fang Xu asks if the spiritual master thing is someone who learned it in the realm of the strange. If that's the case, he wants to know how to do it. Once again, Tang notices he's very calm and confident, so maybe he's the key to getting out of there. And then he explains that to get out of that world, you need to gather the power of the ghosts. You need to meet two conditions simultaneously. The first is to go through the fear between life and death, simulating an emotional trauma. And the second is to come into contact with the ghost to let its power invade your soul. But you must be cautious since ghostly power is like a bloody garment. Even though it covers your body, it also stains your soul. Hearing these words makes Fang Xu thoughtful, especially because he knows that after multiple deaths, 
He avoids contact with the ghosts to not die. From the wife to all the street creatures, they are mere illusions as long as he doesn't interact with them. However, when a ghost crosses into reality, it can kill without the need to be seen. So maybe if he can contact them, he will be able to eliminate them. Fang Zhu wonders if this is a good thing. Remembering his wife, he says he's crazy to become a spiritual master and end her. When suddenly, another person from that place disappears. Tang starts to go crazy, telling everyone to shut up, or they'll attract more ghosts. Fei Fi approaches and asks what they are going to do, she's afraid of disappearing. Fang Xu says it's two and three minutes. Precisely for men, it's a three minute interval, and for women, it's two. The guard disappeared, three minutes later, the girl disappeared, and two minutes later, the other guy disappeared. Following this logic, there are three minutes left for another one of them to vanish. He starts to leave, and the guys ask where he's going if he's trying to get himself killed. Fang Xu Xu says they better start looking for a solution too, or everyone will die in that room. Suddenly, Tang points at him and tells him to stay still because no one is leaving that room. But the protagonist ignores him and says that considering there are eight of them, in 20 minutes there will be no one left. Fang Xu Xu looks back and warns that anyone who tries to stop him will die before the ghosts. Walking down the corridors, the friend with glasses asks why they never find the stairs. While Fang Xu Xu recognizes the lights as the same ones that were in the hospital. Suddenly, he realizes they are now back in the hospital. A friend asks if they are hallucinating because, as far as they remember, they were in the company. Why are they in the horror hospital now? Fang Zhu Xu is now sure that the company and the hospital are overlapping in this reality. The hospital swallowed the company. At this moment, they see a red pool. The entire corridor is dirty, and they recognize the uniforms there as being from the company. Fang Zhu Xu concludes that the ghosts take two minutes with women and three with men because that's the time it takes to eat each type of person. He says they still have some time, and the guy with glasses says that it seems they are still eating Jialing. The protagonist finds it strange because in the hospital, everyone was trapped. And the first time he passed through here, there wasn't all this blood in the corridors. The cuts on the clothes prove they are using some sharp blade, and he found only one like that. Something is coming out of the ceiling, and he remembers that the only one moving freely is the ghost doctor he saw right above him that time. They hear some sounds coming from that direction, and when they look, it's the group that was in the room, coming to ask what they will do. They feel a bit awkward, and the chubby guy asks if they found anything by coming down there first. Suddenly, they scream, and the girl says there is a lot of blood there. Everyone recognizes it as being from their allies' clothes, and Tang asks if everyone was eaten. Fearful, Fifi begs to leave, and Tang says they really need to flee as quickly as possible. They ask Fang Xiu to lead the way, but he says nothing. After a moment of silence, he announces that the time has come. Fifi asks what kind of time he's talking about, and behind them, hair is descending. Hearing the sounds, they slowly turn around, and from the ceiling, the ghost doctor is approaching. The second Fifi gets scared, the creature gets close to the two of them. Everyone tries to run desperately, telling the monster to get away. But something stops Tang. It's Feifei, who had fallen and is begging to be saved. But seeing the monster approaching, he slaps the girl, telling her to let go of him. Seeing everyone flee, Fang Xu remembers the moment he saw the doctor. And on the ground, Feifei is begging not to be abandoned. But the creature is already holding her by the hair. With tears in her eyes, Feifei begged. But the lights went out, and it rained blood in that place. The friend with glasses was shocked to see that Feifei was dead and the monster didn't stop and continued to strike her multiple times. Fang Xu noticed that her scalpel techniques were extremely advanced, so she probably practiced a lot. He and his friend were standing there, but the creature didn't seem to be paying attention. Doing two surgeries at the same time would be almost impossible. The monster puts away the scalpel and opens her mouth to eat Fei Fei. Fang Xu understands that the instinct to eat humans is just because she turned into a ghost. He starts to approach and his friend asks what he's doing next to the monster. Fearlessly, Fang Xu punches her in the face, but he is startled. Her skin feels hard as steel. He remembers that all the creatures he encountered are extremely powerful compared to humans. The only way is to become a spiritual master to change this situation. The friend calls for him, saying they need to run away. But Fang Xu says it's okay because that creature only kills one person at a time. That means when she's eating is the safest moment of all. The friend says that soon the monster will finish. But the protagonist says that Fifi had an extra round piece of flesh there that will make it take a little longer. The friend, upon hearing that, vomits. While Fang Xu remembers that he needs to absorb cursed energy from the creatures. And in a dimension like this, near the ghosts is where the most concentrated power it is. A physical touch would be the best way. Seeing the ghosts' thighs, he pats them to see if he gets infected. The monster's legs are inverted and Fang Xu is patting them. The friend tells him to wake up that it's not the time for this kind of thing. But Fang Xu just says that if he's scared, he can run away. The guy says okay, and if so, this should go all out. He gets closer to the protagonist to touch the ghosts' legs, but soon realizes they are very cold. While padding, the friend says nothing has changed, and Fang Xu says they will continue. The friend says he never thought the first contact would be with a ghost, but these legs are really too long. The protagonist begins to think that this guy has some hidden potential. Since before, he was dying of fear, but now he's drooling. He announces that a minute has passed, 
They will bother her for another 30 seconds and then run immediately. As soon as the clock hits 1.30 on the phone, he stands up, saying it's time to flee. The friend asks if they can really escape and where he's going. Thanks you is sure where he's going as he observed the hospital very well when he walked around. And they will use the terrain advantage to create a distance from the doctor. But hair appears in front of him. He wonders if he miscalculated and how she finished eating so quickly. The amount of flesh Fifi had was enough. Then he notices two silicone implants on the floor. Everything was fake. And now the ghost is behind him. She makes a cut right on his neck. With that, the boy's screen goes dark. After his head rolls through the air, he opens his eyes again. But now he's back the moment with that monster. Right when the friend said it was very cold. Fangsyu concludes that the time loops are defined by events. Or maybe it's like a game where you have to pass a level and part of it gets saved. The friend is having fun but he knows that last time he died because of the silicone. So this time, he can't make the same mistake. He quickly grabs the boy and tells them to get up. But drooling the rascal says it's the first time, they can stay a bit longer. Fangsyu warns that everything there is silicone. So if they don't run now, they'll both die. The friend is shocked now understanding why it was so big. With that, the two are already fleeing down the stairs and encounter the people who were also coming down. The desperate crowd starts running faster than them. But Fang Zhu grabs the handrail and throws himself in front of everyone. The chubby guy says he thought it was the ghost and tells him not to scare them like that. The guy with the glasses wanted to know why everyone was fleeing so slowly. The guy said they weren't slow since they had already descended 20 floors. But Zhao Hao said that's impossible since he and Fang Xiu only descended three to catch up with them. The people tell him to shut up and stop lying. But Tang understands that the ghost is creating false paths. He warns that monsters like this can create illusions in which you get trapped. Fang Xiu becomes thoughtful and observes the discussion. Then he approaches and tells everyone to throw any spare items on the floor to mark the way. With that, they scream and start dropping everything they have in their bags and pockets. Then he tells everyone to go down the stairs quickly. They start running and after a while, they find everything again. The guys recognize the money and bottles they had thrown. But Fang Xiu was interested in the small shirt. Suddenly Tang shouts and says that only a spiritualist can see the exit. He tells everyone to activate their power and try to see something. He clasps his hand saying he doesn't know if that previous experience was enough to unleash the powers. But he hopes it is to escape from there. The people are confused, not knowing how they're going to do that. They start trying like the guy did while Fang Xiu observes the stairs. He remembers that the exits from these corridors were on the right side, so it must be something similar. Seeing this, Tang asks what he's going to do again. He says he doesn't care about praying and is more interested in finding clues to escape from there. Hao was impressed that Fang Xiu was still very calm. While Tang thought he didn't hesitate even for a second when the monster appeared. The strange thing is that now they fled down the stairs and found the two again. Not to mention that both spent at least a minute with the monster in the corridor, so what happened? For some reason, the psycho concludes that they should be taking advantage of the ghost. It makes a lot of sense, but obviously he thinks that's not possible. Thank God. Fang Xiu was touching a wall and Hao asked what he was doing. He was counting between 10, 12, 15 and sent to stop. He said he found it. The friend was impressed that there was actually a door. And Tang appeared, asking if they really found it and came running. The problem was how to open it. He imagined where the lock should be and moved his hand in the void. That opened the door, from which an energy came out. Fang Xiu was about to be the first to enter. But Tang bumped into him and ran out, saying they were finally saved. Everyone passed by him, desperately trying to escape. Hao asked why he was letting everyone go ahead and how he was so calm. Fang Xiu knew very well that facing that creature, there was no reason to try to be fast. When a chubby, big-nosed guy appeared, telling the two to run or they'd be used as shields to die. Fang Xiu's plan was obviously to see who would get caught. That way the ghost would stop and he could increase his spiritual power. The people continued in front, fleeing desperately. Until suddenly they had to choose between two directions. This created a divergence in the team since everyone wanted other people to go ahead to test the paths. And Tang once again asked Fang Xiu what they should do. If he found the iron door, he must know the way out of there. Fang Xiu wasn't very keen on helping since everyone kept pushing and expecting him to die. The group kept shouting, telling him to speak up quickly because the coast was approaching. Fang Xiu just said he didn't care about that. Thinking that for him, everyone there was just a tool. At that moment, the ghost doctor was invincible, and what he had to do was buy time. As he goes down the right path, he thinks that to get out of there, he will have to sacrifice lives. As soon as the group sees him take that path, they start running. And a hand can be heard coming from behind. The chubby guy is the last one and Fang Xiu knows very well that she has arrived. Soon on the ceiling, she is preparing to attack him. As she sees everyone fleeing, she approaches the last one. As the hair draws closer, the chubby guy panics, saying he can't die. Seeing a guy in front, he thinks he didn't give permission for him to run faster. So he grabs him by the collar and throws him back. The blonde falls to the ground, calling out to the chubby guy. But something has already slashed his neck, and the walls are painted with blood. Seeing how the guy did that, Fang Xiu thinks he is no different from a ghost who lost his sanity. But now he needs to increase his spirituality. The group asks what he is going to do. And there he is once again, facing the ghost. 
The sick friend approaches, saying he can't have all the fun without inviting him. Staying that smooth cold skin like that is like ice jade. Fang Xu thinks the guy suddenly turned into a poet. Seeing how crazy he is, maybe he will also awaken spiritual power and together, they can escape. Some time later they are fleeing again and Fang Xu asks if he's not afraid of dying. Hao says that waiting for death is worse than being killed directly. Besides, he trusts him because he's there. At that moment, they arrive at the cafeteria. Everyone is dying of hunger and thirst as they've been running for a long time. Tang starts grabbing everything, saying he will hand it out to others later. The chubby guy approaches, asking to share a bit. When suddenly a girl says she found something and he tells her not to move. It's a door and he approaches, saying they are saved. But as soon as he opens it, there's another door at the end of the corridor. Fang Xu notices that the light there is more suppressed than before. As he approaches the door, Fang Xu says it's not locked. As they open it, it's just a utility room. That was the end of the path they chose, and the problem now is that to go back, they will have to wait for someone to die and distract the doctor. The protagonist started to head back in search of the coast while everyone cursed him for choosing the wrong path. Obviously, he didn't like that because he didn't ask anyone to follow him. Hao commented that everyone should do what they want, and brother Fang Xu didn't force anyone to follow him. A chubby guy complained, saying it didn't matter since it looked like he chose without knowing anything. Tang tried to calm everyone down, saying to concentrate as survival was the priority. He said that from what he observed, that creature attacks one person at a time and rests for two to three minutes. The choice now is to pick someone to serve as a distraction and create an opportunity for everyone to escape. Fang Xu understood immediately what was going to happen. Tang came and hit him on the chest, saying that if it wasn't for him, no one would be there. So he would have to be the one chosen to pay for the sins. Hao asked what he was doing and Tang shouted for everyone to help. But Fang Xu stepped in and put him in a chokehold. As he was pulled away, he called the chubby guy to help, who now put Hao in a chokehold too and fell with him to the ground. Suddenly, the door slammed shut. Fang Xu had isolated himself outside. The group asked what he was doing. Fang Xu said he never imagined he'd be so interested in people. Apparently, they are stranger than ghosts. He thanked them for their interest, but warned that he would make everyone pay next time. And with that, he died again. As his body fell to the ground, the group opened the door to run out. Hao with tears in his eyes, went to help Fang. And as Tang looked back, smiling, he saw something terrifying. Even dead, Fang Xu was smiling and told him to just wait a little longer. Back to the moment, he warned that it was silicone. He ran out, but this time smiling in a macabre way. The guys were running down the stairs, trying to escape, thinking the ghost was coming. When once again, he fell in front. Ignoring everyone, he started running as they asked what he was doing. While he descended the steps, counting the group was once again dealing with the problem of walking in circles. He reached the door and opened it without fear. No one understood how he found it so quickly. Tang asked if he had awakened his spiritual powers, but he just ignored them and warned they had one minute before the ghost would appear. Seeing this, Tang smiled, saying it seemed he had indeed awakened his powers. If he helped him escape, he would pay five million. But Fang Xu just smiled, saying there was no need to rush because he needed to resolve something before leaving. When Tang was about to ask what it was, Fang Xu knee him in the groan. The poor guy groaned and fell to the floor in pain. Fang Xu said he should use the five million to treat that. Agonizing, Tang said he could pay even more if only he asked. But now the protagonist was cold. The rest of the company started cursing him, asking how he could be so dirty. But Fang Xu warned that it was impossible to escape the ghost's speed. But with Tang on the ground, everyone was saved. The group was confused about this notion of being saved. Until suddenly, another kick landed and now the chubby guy was writhing on the floor. Fang Xu said he should have died a long time ago. Hao and the rest of the group were asking if he had gone mad and if he was going to do this to everyone. Fang Xu said no because he needed at least one person left. Hao said it was a good plan, while the group began to question if he was really human. He pointed the way and said they were running out of time, but the group began to suspect since he wasn't leading the way. Fang Xu said he would just stay there to touch some thighs. The group was confused, and the psychopath friend said he definitely wanted to stay then. The doctor ghost approached once again. As soon as the group saw her, they resumed fleeing, but they stopped right behind the wall to observe what would happen while the protagonist watched the monster approach. On the ground, Tang begged to be saved, but he soon realized his pants were wet. Fang Xu's kick had caused internal bleeding, and he jumped to grab his legs, saying they would die together. But Fang Xu just stepped on his hand and told him not to worry. He would stay there, right beside him, watching him die. The monster grabbed his neck, and with that, the guy was gone. Paint covered Fang Xu's face, which he even licked. The guy was really crazy. He even said that the taste of revenge wasn't so bad. But at that moment, he felt something in his heart, and wonder how it was possible for his chest to beat so fast. Suddenly, he heard his wife's voice calling for him, and thought it would be amazing to see her get torn apart like this guy. He began making advances toward the ghosts, and the group wondered if this was really his plan. He stared at Hao, and remembered that at the moment of his death, the guy had a call for him. With that, he invited his friend to join in. But Hao didn't seem very keen, and everyone called him a ghost. At that moment, Fang Xi realized that having died those 20 times and experienced so much madness, 
was causing him to no longer have any emotional fluctuations. His humanity was slowly disappearing, and at that moment he and Zhao Hao were completely different. But he had no option so he wouldn't force his friend. But suddenly Zhao said that in that company he was the only person he could trust. As he was his only true friend, he would trust his plan. But he said he looked scary with that wine all over his face. But he soon approached with a blushing face to activate more spiritual power. While they were having fun, Hao asked why he attacked those two. Fang Xu said that considering the ghost's speed, it was impossible to escape. And as soon as she caught up, those two, having higher positions, would discard the others. Suddenly, he felt something and asked Hao if he felt the coldness approaching his body. Hao said no, he was normal. While Fang Xu realized it wasn't an illusion, what he was feeling was an influence of the ghost's power. He noticed that the connection was very weak, but it seemed to be reaching a critical point. Perhaps it was the precursor to gaining spiritual powers. But now Hao seemed motivated, wanting to find this cold region. Suddenly, he warned they should run. However, Fang Xu said there was no problem since the chubby guy was lying nearby. The boy smiled, saying that was really good news. But he asked what it felt like to awaken spirituality since he wasn't feeling anything. Fang Xu explained that what he probably lacked were life or death situations. The mental state hadn't reached the necessary point yet, which is why he didn't feel it. Hao found that strange and wondered when Fang Xu experienced something like that. Seeing her lick the chubby guy's face, he said it was a good thing because it would take about five minutes. They would have to use this time to absorb as much as possible. And with that, the cold energy began to invade Fang's body. He started to try to perceive where it was going, and soon felt it seemed to be going to his brain and heart. They were now turning into blocks of ice. A cold blade cut through his entire body. And after being shattered, a light appeared in his chest. A flash that concentrated and turned into a red sphere. As soon as Fang Zhu regained consciousness, he realized that all his five senses had been sharpened. Even his thinking speed and control over his body had improved. It was as if more parts of the world had become available to him. But he realized he had awakened less than 1% of his spiritual capacity. The ability seemed to be related to the desire he felt. He wondered what that was and suddenly felt a shock in his heart. He agonized and wondered if his ability was to cause pain. The sequence of deaths made his greatest desire to return that sensation. Whether it was negative emotions, mind distortions, or pain, he could make enemies experience all of it. Out of nowhere, he smiled and started laughing, saying that now he was incredible with this ability. Seeing him go crazy, Hao asked if that had worked, while Fang Xu concluded that he had received the best possible ability for him. Remembering his dear wife, he stood in a trance while Hao called for him, saying that two minutes had passed. But Fang Xu just told him to step aside as he was going to test his power. Immediately, Hao stepped back, saying it seemed to have worked and that was very good. He then approached the ghost doctor. Concentrating the power in his hand, he knew that it carried everything he had experienced in those days. He knew that the more times he died, the more pain he would accumulate and the stronger he would become. As long as he continued being revived, he could infinitely strengthen himself. He punched the ghost in the face, saying he wanted her to experience this masterpiece. The punch hit her squarely, but the power seemed to dissipate. She was thrown back and dropped the scalpel while crying on the floor. But Fang Xu immediately realized that his punch was mediocre, and the little spirituality he had was now exhausted. The blow hadn't hurt the ghost, and she didn't seem to have felt the pain he did. While he thought about this, Ho said maybe it was time to run away, or they could go back to touching again. He thought that maybe putting this energy into weapons would be the best way. And speaking of weapons, there was one right on the ground for him to use. He crouched to pick it up, but soon felt an energy. That blade seemed impossible to lift, and its power immediately attacked Fang's heart. He could see all the times that weapon had been used, the infinite amount of pain it had absorbed. But with so much resentment, he wondered if he could use it to end the doctor. He told Hao to step aside. As soon as he did, he attacked the doctor right on the back of the neck. But it did nothing. Hao pulled at her shirt and said it didn't even leave a scratch. How are they going to kill her like this? The friend kept patting her back, and Fang Xu concluded that without spiritual power, it wouldn't work. At that moment, he understood that revenge was not possible right now. She was getting up, and he was driving Hao, saying it was time to run. As soon as the monster got up, she wondered where the scalpel was. Walking with Hao, he sensed someone's presence. With his sharpened senses, he could perceive the presence of others. Hao asked where they were going when the two who had been hiding appeared. Hao called them cowards for running away and now coming back to ask for help. But Fang Xu said there was only one solution. They would have to go through each of the four doors. Everyone was scared and the guy said that with the monster following them, they only had time to try one. Fang Xu ignored them and walked away, saying he wasn't forcing anyone to follow him. As soon as they heard a sound behind them, they knew she was getting closer. Fang Xu realized that by stealing the scalpel, the ghost behavior would change. He opened the door and told everyone to run. They started climbing the stairs in desperation. As soon as they closed the door, it was destroyed from behind and the ghost began to ascend the corridor. With a macabre face, she told him to give it back. She ignored everyone on the stairs and went face to face with Fang, telling him to hand over the scalpel. Fang Xu managed to defend himself when she attacked, but then she opened her mouth and went for his neck. At the east gate, they died. They went to another room. 
This time, he ended up coloring the chubby guy in another place. Once again, he stole the scalpel and headed in another direction, smiling. They ran to the north gate and reached the elevator. But as soon as he tried to enter, the monster opened the door and finished him off too. Then he tried the south gate. But once again, he was caught by the malicious and flexible coast. Really cruel since he died. He tried the last door. He didn't want to accept that by stealing the scalpel, he would always die. Even though she was extremely fast, he still had the revive to change the trajectory each time. In a way, it was as if he could foresee the future. He knew there was a safe passage to the left. But something came at his neck and once again, he died. It had already been the ninth time, and now he was sure he could do it. He guided everyone in that same direction. The ghost appeared behind everyone and approached him. She was once again heading straight for Fang. At that moment, Ho turned and told him to be careful. Right when she was about to land a blow on his face, he managed to sidestep, making her miss, and stood face to face with the doctor. She was confused about how he dodged, and Ho found it impossible that he had done that. Smiling like a madman, Fang Xu fled. Once again, she tried to hit him and he managed to duck. After numerous deaths, he had learned her attack patterns. Moreover, the pain was strengthening his body and increasing his spiritual power. Ha was impressed with his ability to predict movements. The ghost didn't like this at all. She prepared to jump and bite him, but he was confident that he now knew her trajectory entirely. As she came at him once again, he rolled to the side and dodged again. The ghost was already going crazy, telling him to die already. The group couldn't believe he was escaping her. While Ha was thinking this was the power of a spiritual master, running towards the door, he once again saw the exit, confident that now they would escape. But strangely, the ghost stopped in front of him. He was confused and she told him not to go while trembling. Fang Xu found it strange because she seemed scared. With that, she fled, delivering a precise attack on poor Hao. The poor guy staggered back, wondering what that cold thing was. He ran to Fang Xu and asked what had happened. He said everything was normal and according to logic, that was the path to survival. But he realized that even the doctor fled when she saw that place. That meant it might not be the exit, but rather something so terrifying that even she was scared. He knew it was the mouth of an abyss. The group kept asking why he didn't run. He sat down, saying it was good to rest for a while. After thinking a bit, he had an idea and told everyone to get up. Once again, they walked through those hospital corridors, and he slowly approached the metal door, wondering if there really was a great danger outside. As he began to open it, Hao asked if it wouldn't be risky to do so. He said they had no option but to go and enter the darkness. There, he couldn't see anything at all, and the place was so silent that he could hear his thoughts. The darkness had swallowed the path from which he came, so the only option was to move forward. He kept moving forward and forward, it seemed that the very sense of time had been consumed. It was as if the path had no end. After walking for what felt like an eternity, he opened his eyes and found himself in front of the academy's entrance, making him wonder if he had really escaped. Everyone ran past and Hao celebrated that they had finally escaped. The guy wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible, and Hao called out to Fang, telling him to run too. But Fang Xu knew something was strange. When he looked back, he remembered. The only visible thing was the school and the hospital had disappeared. Hao said he just wanted to go home and rest because the day had been exhausting. That's when Fang noticed something. He started running around saying it had vanished. There were no ghosts in the city. He couldn't accept that he escaped without any reason. He could accept the hospital disappearing, but not the disappearance of all the ghosts. How would he be able to get revenge on his dear wife? He found himself in front of a car saying that she had to die at his hands. That's why he needed to go home. But the driver braked and now he was in the passenger seat, murmuring to himself that she couldn't just disappear like that. He didn't want his wife to vanish that way. As soon as the taxi stopped, he ran home desperately. The driver complained that he hadn't paid, but he didn't care and ran up the stairs, saying that world couldn't disappear. He entered his house, shouting that she couldn't leave him like that, but the place seemed normal. After checking all the rooms, he fell to the floor, saying that she had killed him 18 times. How could he live without her for the rest of his life? All that suffering at the hands of the ghost doctor was to get revenge. He accumulated rage and pain to end the ghosts, but now they were all gone. Lying on the bed, he wondered where he would direct all that hatred. And now, without any feeling, what was the meaning of life? At that moment, he received a message on his phone, telling him to check the news. The Beilu Academy was burning. He immediately saw that the news reported a fire that engulfed the entire building. More than 11 people died, including some of the bosses there. The psychopath Feng Xu started laughing, because the message said they had found his body dead. He got excited, thinking that apparently the mysterious things hadn't ended. They just wanted to play hide and seek with him. Now he was sure he could see his wife again. On his phone, he was getting a bunch of messages from the boss telling him to come to work. He laughed because this guy was dead. It was ironic that even dead, the boss kept ordering him to work. Suddenly, a bloody message appeared on the phone, saying that just because he wasn't speaking, it didn't mean he didn't know. An energy came out of the phone and created an eye that said it saw him, and ordered him to follow now. Fang Xiu calmly grabbed the eye and told it to stop possessing the phone because he only had one. With that, the illusion dissipated. But he was curious to see what the next mystery was. Now in front of the academy, which was completely destroyed. 
He smelled the burnt everything and thought it looked very realistic. Suddenly, he saw Fifi standing there. All excited, she came to talk to him, saying he arrived early today. He touched her shoulders and asked if she was real. She said he was getting very bold. But suddenly, he pulled her, saying he knew very well how things had happened. He was going to climb the stairs when Hao appeared and asked if he was forced to work. He said he actually liked it a lot and asked where Boss De Hai was. Hao pointed and said the guy was at the back of the room. Strangely, company was as busy as ever. And Fang Xiu began to wonder if what he saw was a lie and this was actually reality. When he found the boss, he was scolded being asked why he had responded to the message in the group. Fang Xiu ignored this and asked when he would receive his commissions. De Hai said he had the nerve to arrive late and talk about commissions. While Fang Xiu complained saying that even dead, De Hai was disgusting. The boss pointed his finger at him, asking what he was talking about, dying, and told him to speak properly because he was very much alive. But suddenly, Fang Xiu finished him off with the ghost doctor's weapon. The boss groaned and fell to the ground. Fang Xiu smiled saying that apparently, now he wasn't alive anymore. Everyone at work stands up and stares at him. Fang Xiu walks over to Hao, pats his shoulder and asks what happened. Suddenly, Hao's body inflates and transforms. Fang Xiu realizes that everyone's bodies are cursed and starts finishing them off. When he's done, he asks whoever did this if they had enough fun, but he realizes it's all a dream. On the ground, the people are writhing, begging for a like in this video to help Momoro make more juicy content for his viewers, activate the cheeky little bell, and I'm out.